So welcome back to the next lecture in the F110 Autonomous Racing course. Today we will begin with the first module uh, of this course, which is going to last for a couple of weeks. And it's going to focus on teaching you uh, uh, ROS, or Robot Operating System. And so this will be a very introductory lecture today where I want to tell you about what ROS is. If you recall from the, from the course introduction video, um, we use ROS for everything related to the software implementation of our perception, planning, and control algorithms uh, on board the uh, 110 scale autonomous race car. So, so this is a beginner level introduction to what is ROS, why is it so popular in robotics, and why do we use it, why is it so uh, valuable and makes it so easy to implement an autonomous race car. Uh, and so, so if you aren't familiar with ROS at all, but you have sort of heard about it, then this is the video for you. If you're already familiar, then this would be more of a refresher, but I will touch upon some of the sort of the latest and the greatest uh, in this world of robot operating system. Uh, specifically, you know, we'll touch upon what is ROS1 versus what is ROS2, and many, many developers looking to get into ROS uh, often have questions on, you know, how should they learn? So. So we assume no background uh, for this particular course in ROS. We will teach you ROS, like I said, over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, accompanied with lab sessions as well. Uh, so it's not just about the, the videos and the lectures. You will actually implement um, some of the command line tools that I will talk about today. Uh, and that will serve as a, an exercise to get familiar with the ROS ecosystem and also shed some light on you know, what is ROS1, what is ROS2, and how does F110 uh, use ROS? So we use ROS uh, very, very extensively. So, so with that being said, let's jump right into the, the video itself. Um, I do want to acknowledge a lot of different uh, organizations and institutes. There's a lot of tutorials out there uh, on ROS, which introduce ROS. So what I have tried to do here is uh, put that material together in a manner which is very, very accessible to a beginner, uh, and also with some emphasis on the F110 ecosystem. Okay, but before we actually talk about ROS, I just want to remind um, anyone who's following this that uh, you do need to have access to uh, Ubuntu 18.04. This is a recommended Linux installation to follow along um, the lectures in this course. And if you have Ubuntu 18.04 or access to that, either through a virtual machine or a dual boot or a dedicated PC, um, either of those is fine. Uh, you also need to install uh, a particular distribution of ROS on it, right? So, uh, so here's your first introduction to ROS. ROS is not really an operating system like Ubuntu or Windows or Mac. Uh, it's a meta operating system, and we'll talk more about what that means uh, in just a second. But uh, ROS does have different distributions which are compatible with different base or host installations of the OS. So for the 18.04 Bionic, the distribution of ROS uh, that we will use uh, is called ROS Melodic. And when you install ROS Melodic from the uh, ROS.org wiki page, with a link to which is also shown here, I highly recommend that you install the, the desktop full version of, uh, of ROS Melodic. Um, just a small fine print here. If you have 20 or 4, uh, um, you may want, you will have to install uh, the next version of ROS1, which is called ROS Noetic, uh, because Melodic is supposed to be compatible with 1804. And um, uh, on that topic itself, uh, you may be fine with using 20.04 for the learning ROS uh, part of the course. But as soon as we jump into the actual F110 simulator, uh, I think your hand is sort of forced because our simulator currently is using uh, ROS Melodic and it will only work with that. So it's just a heads up that you may be fine with whatever distribution of uh, uh, Ubuntu you are using right now, but um, uh, sooner rather than later, you have to uh, you know, get access to this configuration and we'll talk a little bit more of that in the lab session. Okay, so the way I have organized this particular lecture is uh, very, very straightforward. I want to answer all of these questions uh, by the end of the hour. So why do we need ROS? Uh, what is robot operating system? Uh, I'll give you a good introduction and make you familiar with some of the popular tools and command line tools that ROS uses that you have to become familiar with, and you will by the time we are done with this first module. Uh, 
and then uh, in the last sort of uh, uh, part of this uh, video, I'm going to cover uh, what is ROS2 because uh, you may be reading online or as you try to install, you may find uh, hyperlinks to you know install ROS2. So it may appear okay, two is better than one. It probably is, but we want to you know make it clear uh, what is ROS2, who is it meant for, and why or why not are we using ROS2 in this course? So let's uh, let's get started with this, right? So. We will pick up from where we kind of touched upon in our in our previous lecture, where I showed you this exact um, um, illustration that no matter what autonomous uh, self-driving prototype there is on the road, it has to solve all of these problems. Right? It has to localize itself, figure out where it is, figure out what everybody else is doing, uh, what are the different objects uh, on in the scene itself, so that all of this uh, together is called scene understanding. Uh, once we understand the scene, we have to figure out a way to navigate that scene. Uh, and by navigate, I don't mean go from point A in the city to point B in the city. Uh, it's uh, not routing, it's navigation in the sense of making immediate decisions of lane changing or slowing down or speeding up and things like that. And so uh, we know and we understand based on our introductory lecture that a lot of this is done using uh, data from the perception stack, right? So perception is simply the, the sensing and the array of sensors that you have on board uh, that give you this holistic surrounding uh, and understanding of what the world looks like from the perspective of uh, a self-driving car, which is just a robot on four wheels. So uh, we have many, many different uh, types and varieties of sensors, but the popular ones are shown here. I won't go into a lot of detail again. We already kind of touched upon this uh, earlier. What I want to emphasize is that there is so much variety uh, and um, of sensors and things to, uh, to perceive in our environment uh, that you know, you need some very solid software development to bring this all together, right? So what you want, and we are just talking about perception right now, we haven't even touched uh, planning or control related tasks. So here's another view of the same um, the same kind of uh, you know scene understanding part of the the self driving stack where uh, we show that you know the perception is responsible for ingesting data from the actual physical sensors so you have GPS and lidar camera radars uh, or a combination of those uh, and together you know they may be using some map information some localization information and things like that and. If we analyze this from a different perspective, here's just a, you know some generic idea about um, that these different sensor types they're generating a lot of data uh, at varying rates, by the way, right? So uh, there is no um, guarantee that your lidar is going to give you the lidar scans at the same rate as your camera is going to give you fresh images, or your radar is going to give you uh, new radar scan data. So, so here's just a, a you know kind of a back of the envelope uh, guesstimation exercise to give you some sense of what are the different sensor types, uh, what is a typical quantity that you would find on a, on a you know a fully blown uh, AV prototype that many industry uh, uh, folks are testing on public roads, and then in the third column you will see a estimate of what is the bandwidth of data that is generated from uh, each of these sensing modalities. Uh, and so here the emphasis is just on sheer uh, total estimated bandwidth. You can uh, easily get up to, um, you know, a couple of uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, gigabytes or terabytes of data uh, in very short amount of time. Uh, and so that you know in itself is a. Uh, is something to think about. You need the software that can handle all this data. It can time synchronize all this data. So there's nothing better than to actually see how, how all of this is put together. So here's, I have taken the liberty of borrowing some images from a very, very early stage prototype from a few years ago from Autoware Foundation. And so you see their uh, self-driving car stack. Uh, they have you know a lot of different uh, sensors. You have a, a Velodyne, which is a LiDAR. Uh, it's a 3D LiDAR as opposed to the 2D scanning LiDAR we have on board. And you have different types of uh, these LiDARs as well. You have the, uh, the RTK GNSS, which is the GPS or you know, the ground navigation satellite system. You have a, a different camera over here uh, facing the, the, the front the dashboard view of the, of the driver and looking at the road and the lane markings. And then you have a radar uh, as well, which is mounted on you know, maybe the four corners of the car. 
And so all of this data is getting pushed to a, a computer, a, a very specific GPU-enabled computer. One example shown from NVIDIA. Again, this is a little bit dated. We have better, better computers than this uh, from NVIDIA and others. And so it all comes in together. And this is running, uh, in this case, it's actually running ROS, right? So ROS is uh, ingesting all this data. Uh, and so this is what the what the car looks like, and uh, you know you do a good job of making sure uh, it doesn't scare people off with all these wires and uh, different sensors. Uh, and so you do a good job of hiding uh, your crimes, if you will, uh, in terms of where to place these sensors. I actually like looking at the sensors on the car, but that's that's a different story. And then in the back, you know, you can clean up the job, and everything comes into the central computer, which is running the perception planning and control software. And so in this example, that software is called AutoWare. It's based upon ROS, and it's an open source uh, stack for perception planning control for a full-scale car, right? So, so you have the stack uh, um, running on board this uh, uh, you know, uh, high bandwidth, uh, high GPU-enabled computer, um, and getting all this data. And this, this picture is a little bit busy to get into all the details right now. We will, you know, at a later point, uh, take a closer look at AutoWare, uh, which is uh, uh, now also getting ported to ROS2. But this gives you some sense of, you know, that ROS is not the only thing running on the car. Stuff in uh, orange in this image uh, is the actual ECU or the CAN network of the car, right? So the car uh, is almost like a computer on wheels already without the automation. Uh, and so you have a, a lot of different ECUs uh, which are responsible for monitoring different uh, parts of the uh, uh, of the actual operation of the vehicle. And they are not implemented in ROS, but they then have to interact with decisions uh, of the autonomous uh, driving stack. So uh, a, a simpler version of that, but simpler only in scale, not in concept, is uh, you know the kind of implementation uh, on the F110 car. So it looks very similar. We also have our own perception sensors or a set of sensors, very similar to the full-scale uh, full stack. Um, and then, you know, we have uh, uh, wireless telemetry. Our onboard computer is from the same family of uh, CDs as you just saw in the AutoWare case. Uh, and we don't have a CAN network on the F110 car. Uh, the closest thing to that is that we have a specific motor controller uh, because it powers the, the, the direct uh, uh, drive motor and the steering servo. And so, so very similar to uh, AutoWare, we also have our own uh, perception planning and control modules, uh, which have to crosstalk and work with each other. So, you know, the whole point of uh, uh, this mini recap of uh, uh, focusing on the sensor, the hardware side, uh, and the volume of data and how it may all come together uh, was just one one small point that I want to make uh, to give you a sense of that even with simple sensors and straightforward kind of individual modules, bringing it all together and making sure that you know your your code doesn't crash, which in turn means your car doesn't crash. Uh, it's a significant undertaking and one that we may not think about when we think about self-driving cars. Uh, and so to 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 motivate further uh, this complexity and how it could be a burden in terms of programming your autonomous race car, uh, I want to talk about uh, the motivation or the need uh, for ROS to begin with, right? So so, and to do that, we'll actually take a, a detour and not talk about cars at all. Just like let's talk about a generic uh, or a, a different uh, robot application. So let's do this thought experiment or, or a mental exercise of uh, programming a robot and thinking about you know what does it take to program a robot uh, in the absence of something like ROS. And so to, to set this up, we need an example. And so the example of choice uh, is, is this robot. It's like a mini uh, humanoid robot. Um, and you know this this uh, picture is a little bit poor resolution, but if it's not legible, uh, it's just showing that the eyes have USB cameras. There's like a, a gyroscope or an accelerometer which tells the robot it's going to tip over or gives it its kind of pose or orientation. Uh, there's servos which move the arms and the feet uh, and has to maintain its balance. There may be some uh, Wi-Fi capability that it can communicate with other such robots. And these are just like basic, basic, uh, you know, perception um, on this robot itself. So with this robot in mind, uh, a very popular robotics competition is we use robots such as this and we have them uh, play soccer against each other, right? So this is the RoboCup famous uh, international competitions which has been going on for more than a decade now. So, so 
So here's what I want you to think about, right? So given this robot, which has these aforementioned sensors, like how would you go about programming this robot? And I know that's a that's a loaded question. So let me let me uh, make it even simpler. If I ask you as a blue team or the red team to build, um, you know, this uh, this robot that can play soccer with its teammates and score goals, how would you think about, you know, what tasks does an individual robot have to solve? Let's start there. So knowing what sensors it has, can we think about what kind of tasks uh, would we have to code, right? So it's kind of almost coming up with a sequence of tasks or a pseudo code rather than actual implementation of how to program this. So, so give this a thought. I right? think about this, and I'll I'll, I'll try to uh, do this with you. So obviously, I think we need to detect where the ball is. So that's kind of a task. So you know, where is the ball? Uh, and we will use our our uh, kind of USB uh, uh, you know camera sensors in the eyes to to locate the ball. So we have to scan around. Uh, I think another task is to just make sure that uh, the robot you know, remains upright and it doesn't tip over. I think that has to be done at all times. So there's a there's a task of monitoring, let's say the uh, the gyro, which is somewhere in the heart of the robot. Let's say I don't know exactly where it would be, but we can assume it's somewhere in the center of gravity. Uh, and so you can tell if you are about to fall over or not, right? So those are some reasonable tasks, I hope, and maybe. Uh, you can come up with even other tasks, right? So another task would be that, okay, you have to, uh, you know, now talk to your, your teammates about strategy. So you have to uh, tell your teammates. Uh, it's not just enough to detect where the ball is. Uh, you have to know where your own position is and how you have to move in the world uh, to get to the ball, right? So these are all reasonable uh, tasks, I hope you agree, uh, that we all have to do. And there may be many, many more, there may be less but they they seem to be very natural um, um, kind of tasks that we expect a robot to do if the goal is uh, you have to play soccer and uh, these are the capabilities of an individual uh, individual robot right so there's other tasks as well of course where you have to detect where the goal is where the goalkeeper is where is the bigger gap and you can you you know try to score the goal through the bigger gap or or you maybe even uh, deceive the the goalkeeper and try to score through the narrow gap so with this thought experiment and exercise in mind, let's now get into the weeds of how do we actually program this? Or rather, let me say that if in a, in a world without ROS, what would make most sense in order to program this ability into a robot, right? So here's, here's one picture, right? So you can think of this you know, while one loop which is always running in the background. And in that loop, we are doing all of these different tasks as different subroutines. And that's a very typical, reasonable, nothing wrong with it, way of uh, programming all of these tasks into a robot and let it play uh, soccer. So these are exactly you know, an assortment of what we discussed in the previous slide. You, uh, you are reading from the camera to detect the, the, the soccer ball. Uh, and then you're tracking where the ball is, uh, and then, then you are figuring your own position out, which is localization, and you go towards the ball, and then you issue some motor command to line yourself up to you know, take a shot or kick the ball or pass the ball or what have you. So this seems to work, at least on, on paper. Um, so now I want you to think about why is this not a good idea? Or rather than framing it in, in, in that manner, think about what could go wrong when you code your robot in this manner. And uh, there's no points for guessing. The hint is, is, is right here that you know this, this, this sequential nature of programming this robot is very intuitive. However, it suffers from some very kind of uh, you know, deep flaws. Uh, one of which is that because of this monolithic and sequential nature of programming, the flow of execution depends upon you know this order in which each of these subroutines are called, because that's how code executes uh, on a computer. And so, if something goes wrong in an individual subroutine, or it doesn't get the latest data, or it makes a mistake, then the entire code runs the risk of crashing. Right, so so maybe just maybe we 
don't get the latest ball position as expected but that doesn't mean that your original plan to go towards the previous um, to go towards the previous uh, location of the ball which was known to you should change maybe you know it's still worth going there or maybe then figuring out somebody actually has moved the ball or you know the the position of the ball uh, computation shouldn't affect the computation of where you are on the field. Those are separate tasks and therefore in this execution flow diagram, if if we are hung up or something goes wrong in one of the subroutines, for example, uh, you know, this code can crash altogether. Right? So 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 this monolithic code is, is trying to do the right thing, but but you can say that you know when things don't work well then then this is the uh, the end result. <laughs> yeah I I like that uh, robot failures. There are, uh, for some reason, people like failures more than successes, but that's a, a different uh, tangent. So that's the problem, right? So I hope you understand the problem. Right? We, we began with the set of tasks that a robot would have to do. Um, I'll throw in another snippet here. If you look at these tasks, they will also still satisfy the perception planning and control workflow, right? I'll leave it as a uh, a self exercise to figure out which of these tasks are perception, which are planning, and which are control. But the point was, uh, even with simple tasks, which are very specific, coding them in this monolithic manner uh, has some problems. Uh, so, you know, it, it is more prone to failure, let's put it, than uh, an alternative. So here are some of the challenges which you know were, I was trying to capture in that small toy example. There's obviously the challenge of complexity. We only began with let's say half dozen or ten tasks, and already uh, we saw a lot of things can go wrong. A lot of things have to go right, and there's a lot of moving parts to a robot. So imagine Autoware, uh, and now you know the monolithic code for that. It's uh, it's a nightmare to to write that kind of code. So with complexity is uh, you know, associated the problems with the scale uh, at which you want to uh, operate things. Um, there's uh, less flexibility, of course, when you write these monolithic pieces of code. Uh, even if your subroutines are organized as separate executables, you know, if you change something here, you have to go back and see the entire loop doesn't break down and things like that. And then you know it's also inefficient in terms of uh, sometimes memory usage and network uh, usage and things like that. So in a in a nutshell, this is a mess, right? So this is not how you would want to program your robot. Or you may have been used to programming like this on an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. But uh, with this example in mind, I hope you can appreciate some problems with doing this kind of sequential while one loop kind of coding. So if this is a mess, uh, obviously we need to deal with it. And then uh, after a short drum roll, uh, the answer of course is going to be we have to use ROS, right? So ROS will solve uh, among many, many other problems, this particular problem of complexity, flexibility, memory usage, uh, making sure things don't fail if a single component is struggling. And so in a nutshell, ROS uh, is a set of uh, software libraries. Like I said earlier, it's not really an operating system. It works like an operating system in the sense that uh, you, using ROS, you can get your entire robot to, to run the way you want it to without crashing um, and in the manner in which it was intended to run. And so it's a set of packages and uh, libraries which have nodes, and you will get used to this terminology by the end of even this lecture. Uh, and so we'll see what is ROS's way of you know, solving that problem. I haven't shown you the solution yet. I'm just, uh, uh, you know, right now I sound like a Ross salesman trying to pitch you that monolithic sequential coding has its limitations and Ross is a better way of doing that. So why is it better? Uh, there are many reasons and uh, we'll get into some more details of individual uh, verticals on this, uh, on this illustration. Uh, but in a nutshell, almost being like an operating system, it, helps, it makes the life of a robotics developer uh, much, much simpler and much easier to manage complex interactions in very, very complex robots as well. So, so you know, collectively it does uh, four, four of these things very well and many others too. Uh, so plumbing is in a nutshell uh, called the, the process of doing, managing the, this, these different tasks or different executables. And ROS uh, natively is designed to automate that process. So as a developer, you can just focus on uh, these task implementations and not worry about how they interact with each other and uh, how would they fail or, or succeed. Um, then it provides a very rich set of uh, tools, uh, both for simulation, for visualization, for debugging, uh, and that's 
uh, number of tools being developed by the open source community uh, is just growing uh, every day. Uh, it has a lot of existing packages of perception, planning, and control modules that can be repurposed and reused from one robot to the other, from one problem to the other. And then on top of it, everything is free and open source. Uh, it's uh, one of the largest, I would say, open source projects uh, in academia. Uh, and so, you know, even you uh, can contribute to uh, the next distribution of ROS uh, as a ROS developer. So going back to our, our, our example, here is how ROS would implement the same functionality, right? So, so we have the same tasks of looking at the camera, figuring out where the ball is, uh, tracking the ball, uh, planning where you are, um, sorry, planning your motion to the ball, planning where you are, and we have the same set of tasks as there was in the, uh, in the sequential example, but in ROS, each executable or each individual task is running as its own separate process right so they they're not part of one execution of code they are each running their own separate executable process which is called a node and these nodes they exchange relevant data with each other so think of them as still you know they are all they are kind of subroutines but instead of being part of the same sequential execution they are running in parallel and uh, ROS is ensuring that the correct data is passed between the relevant and the correct nodes, right? So if you need to uh, get a laser scan to figure out your own pose, then ROS is going to ensure that the scan which is being sent by this subroutine is being delivered to the localization executable, right? So, so as you can see here, if you get hung up on detecting where the ball is and something is wrong with this stream of, uh, you know, this executable, it doesn't affect your ability to localize yourself, right? So you can still do that uh, with high success, even though a particular node may be suffering for whatever reason. So, so it's definitely better, and you know, when things are better, uh, they work better as well. So this this clip is called the uh, the uh, save of the century at uh, at RoboCup, uh, and so you know, Ross allows you to do uh, these kind of remarkable things. So in a nutshell, this is our answer to the limitations of how we are used to thinking about uh, programming robots, right? So instead of sequen sequential code, we are now moving to non-monolithic, modular, and parallel execution of code. So the philosophy of ROS is that processes are these kind of nodes or executables, and there's a peer-to-peer -peer setup where you just exchange data, which is such a natural way uh, when you think about it, right? In, for the case of an autonomous car, you have these different sensors, and uh, maybe you know the uh, the traffic light detector doesn't need lidar data; it only needs images. So it will uh, have this peer-to-peer -peer connectivity with the camera process, and will uh, get the latest images in order to uh, do its uh, object detection. It's also distributed because it is modular. So distributed could also mean that all these different modules, they don't even necessarily have to run on the same hardware. They can be distributed across hardware as well. They are obviously distributed across the functionality that the robot is doing. Um, it's multilingual, which is very important, meaning that you can use your favorite uh, programming language, C++, Python, Java, or even MATLAB to program some of these nodes. You can even have heterogeneous execution where uh, you know, the computer vision things are mostly C++, so that they run very, very fast, but some of the planning and motion planning uh, is using some Python-based messages as well. So here's a, a bunch of different popular robots which are uh, based on uh, ROS, uh, Robot Operating System. Uh, one of, I think you may recognize some of them and try to uh, I'll try to uh, make you familiar with a few of them. So the one on the top uh, left is the PR2. <clears throat> uh, I think this is a very popular robot. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of decommissioned now, so it's not really under, under uh, new production anymore. Uh, but this is the one which kind of started ROS uh, in the very early days. Uh, this one is also very popular. It's called Baxter. Uh, TurtleBot, I believe, is the, the most famous one. This is like a small, uh, you know, a robot vacuum cleaner base, and it has a, a, like a laptop and some additional sensors that you can add on to it, and you can learn, uh, you know, basic principles of ROS. Uh, here's Husky from, from ClearPath, and this is Robonaut from, from NASA. 
and so many products are are based on ROS, uh, and they were you know used in retail stores, and um, I think this is from 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 Fetch Robotics or, or similar company. Um, so many of these found their ways from academic labs into the real world. Uh, and while on that note, you know, one of the reasons ROS2 is a thing is because there was so much appetite for using ROS in the industry that we had to, uh, you know, fix some of the security and the timing and the real-time aspects uh, of ROS1. Uh, and that's the reason why ROS2 uh, sort of was developed to begin with. That's not the only reason, but it's certainly one of the reasons. Uh, because uh, now with ROS2, the goal is it will be adopted at even a higher pace uh, by the industry. So I uh, don't want to dwell on this too much. A quick history of, uh, of ROS. It came out of a, a project at Stanford about more than a decade ago. Uh, and then it was really you know, packaged together uh, through this effort by a company called Velo Garage, the same company who made uh, uh, the PR2 uh, uh, robot. Uh, PR stands for, I think, personal robotics. And so, so since then, there's many different distributions of ROS uh, till date. Uh, and ROS has actively maintained uh, by Open Robotics. It was earlier called the uh, Open Robotics, uh, Open Source Robotics Foundation, and now it's just called Open Robotics. This is the organization which actively uh, maintains and releases new distributions of ROS. Um, so you know, here's in the last decade, you see um, several distributions uh, of ROS. Uh, each one of them it gets named in the alphabetical order, uh, kind of like how Android releases their different versions. Uh, so, uh, so uh, two of them I want to draw your attention to. The one that we'll be using in this course uh, is called ROS Melodic uh, down here. It was released in 2018, but uh, uh, it will be supported till uh, 2023, um, the same uh, which is the end of life of Ubuntu 18.04. So we still have several years, but I do believe this would be the last year we would uh, work with ROS1 and because we are also switching to ROS2 on F110 and I'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. Uh, if you have 2004, you should be installing um, uh, ROS Noetic, uh, which is the compatible version. And as I said in the very beginning, it would be fine to learn ROS, but our simulator still uses 1804 and Melodic. So all of these are what were originally just called ROS distributions, as is the title here. But now the correct name for these would have been ROS1 distributions because there's something called ROS2, which uh, is also an ongoing effort for a, a good amount of time now. And uh, the latest version of ROS2 is what is called ROS2 Foxy. Um, and uh, in this course, I will teach you ROS1 first because I still think knowing how ROS works, how these nodes work, what are topics and publishers and subscribers, uh, it helps understand, uh, uh, you know, what uh, what ROS2 is. So, so we will focus on ROS1 and use uh, uh, ROS Melodic as our base implementation to learn that, or ROS Noetic as well. There's not really a difference in terms of the learning. Um, but then, towards the end of uh, end of the ROS module, and even at, at the tail end of the course, um, I will have like a dedicated uh, video for uh, transitioning to ROS2, or how would you go about uh, running ROS2 on the F1 10th car, something which is actually an ongoing process. So uh, uh, you might be confused, or at least when people look at all of these uh, uh, ROS release uh, uh, logos, they do a very good job, I must admit, on designing these uh, distribution logos. Uh, you know, so I think a natural question is, what's up with all these turtles, man? Like, uh, what is the obsession with ROS and turtles? Uh, it's a good question, and I promise you uh, we will answer that question by the end of, uh, of today's lecture. So F110 is also growing, and um, with this change in the ROS community, uh, we are partnering with the uh, Open Robotics, uh, and uh, uh, there's an ongoing effort to install and make F110 the physical car, and then later also maybe the simulator uh, compatible with ROS2 as well. So we will also, you know, in the future transition to ROS2 completely, uh, which is the intent of uh, of these distributions. I forgot to mention this that um, Noetic is the last ROS1 distribution. There will be no more uh, um, uh, ROS1 distributions after that, and I, I believe it will be supported until the year 2025. So in addition to uh, open robotics, uh, you know, we are also working with the Autoware Foundation and other open source foundations to grow this 
uh, open source ecosystem centered around the F110 autonomous racing effort. So very quickly, uh, a little bit more uh, snippets about uh, what is ROS and the community and the ecosystem. So um, Open Open Robotics, not the Open Source uh, Robotics Foundation, um, um, they renamed themselves to Open Robotics. Uh, they they actually you know they are the active maintainers of ROS, and there's full time ROS developer positions in in this company and this foundation. Uh, but obviously, a lot of the contribution also comes from industry, academia, and a lot of hobbyist robotics, uh, roboticists as well. Um, and so, you know, anyone can contribute, uh, obviously subject to some, some guidelines and, and specs. You can contribute new standards, new message types, new packages as well. So in the future, we would have even like a F110 ROS package. So, you know, we don't have to worry about individual pieces. You can just download the entire package and will support many, many autonomous racing functionalities out of the box. Uh, so you can even go and check the, the build farm, so which gives you um, a much more deeper insight into individual packages in ROS. I'll explain in a bit what these packages are. Uh, and so the community is very strong, it's growing. Uh, and with this uh, transition to ROS2, even more people from the industry side are, are heavily participating and growing the adoption of ROS and improving the support of ROS2 on different platforms, both robotics and on different operating systems as well. And so you can check out, you know, this particular image shows the, the status of the build from for Kinetic. There's like a, uh, you know, active maintainer. So if something is not working, you can literally, you know, uh, open a Git issue uh, with that package and the maintainer and they will be able to, to help you out. Uh, in addition to this open source, uh, um, ecosystem built around ROS. Um, there's something called ROSCon, which is a you know, ROS conference, which has been going on for um, just a little shy of uh, last 10 years. The latest one was a virtual conference called ROS World held in 2020. Um, and so this is where the community comes together and we talk about the latest and the greatest in terms of you know, different robots which are using ROS. Someone has fixed or improved particular aspect of ROS both at the low level or the kernel level, if you will, uh, if you you know want to associate this in terms of an operating system, uh, new packages, of course, uh, new security uh, protocols and things like that. Uh, in fact, you know your own TA Varun Dev uh, for this course, uh, here's him giving a talk at uh, Roscon in 2019 about the autonomous racing simulator. So uh, it's a very good 25 minutes to spend. Uh, uh, and skip that Netflix episode to watch his talk. So the reason we want, want to emphasize ROS uh, is, um, as well is because it's a, it's a very in-demand skill, right? So definitely there's need for, for expertise, uh, not just in computer science, but uh, very specific expertise to know uh, what is robot operating system in industry, both in grad school and industry as well. Uh, and you know this is just an assortment of uh, many kind of job postings that you will find uh, where they are requesting that the candidate have familiarity with the uh, with ROS. So it's not enough anymore, I believe, to just know uh, concepts. You need to know how to implement them on real devices, real robots, or the simulation equivalent of of real robots. Uh, and so you know I've always maintained this is a great time to get involved in autonomous systems and robotics and this is the first step to begin that journey to get comfortable knowing ROS. And that's why we will spend a good amount of time uh, teaching you ROS about its concepts. So you become very, very uh, comfortable in using ROS1 and then transition if you need to, to ROS2. And you know, no secret, uh, I already showed you AutoWare as an example. Here is a talk from one of the ROSCons. Uh, uh, guaranteed it was a few years ago, so their stack may have changed by now. Uh, but uh, big companies who are uh, exploring autonomous driving are also using uh, robot operating system as their backbone. So here is, you know, uh, a, a picture which tries to show the power of ROS. So these are uh, an assortment of some packages which are used on the F110 car, right? So you have uh, these perception packages. So some of these are related to the LiDAR and some to the camera. Uh, and so you can think of them as not just device drivers, but also uh, getting that data uh, and parsing it or doing some logical operations on the data, right? So that's what a node is. So you have uh, perception planning and control packages, which are 
uh, written by uh, you know the ROS developers or someone in the community and shared. Uh, and so you can just use whatever package you want, right? So so Hector Slam is just a implementation of a map building algorithm. It doesn't matter if it is running on a one tenth scale car or a full scale car. Well, it matters a little bit. That statement is not completely true. Uh, it matters, you know, what configurations you use, but the algorithm itself, the need of it remains the same. And that's the power of using ROS because you have access to thousands and thousands of these packages that you can incorporate into your own project and then embed them with your own code and get your robot to do what you want to do. And in addition to these packages, uh, ROS offers the ability to give us a lot of different tools. I touched upon this very briefly, but here are some examples of specific tools that you will get familiar with, right? So one of them is called the Gazebo Simulator. So as the name implies, this is a robotics simulator. It's a 3D rigid body dynamic simulator. Um, so you can create a, a, not just a rendering, but an actual 3D model uh, specifying the joint properties and the forces and the tire traction and and all uh, you know everything in detail about your robot, uh, and you can place virtual sensors and and, and create a world or a map uh, in this virtual simulation and then basically treat it as a substitution for the real world robot in terms of your development cycle and um, as I've said you know in this offering of the F110 course we will be using the Gazebo F110 simulator as well because that's uh, you know very very powerful in terms of what it can do. Uh, there's visualization tools like Arvis. Um, Arvis just stands for ROS Visualization. Uh, and so whenever you see these kind of maps that I have shown you in the first lecture, or you see you know, some LiDAR scans or some pose or 3D coordinate systems, um, there are chances are that you are looking at an Arvis visualization, right? So the kind of visualizations I'm talking about here, uh, on the left-hand side is the gazebo view of the simulator of a full-scale car. Uh, I believe this is from a project in Michigan. And on the right-hand side, you see the, the Arvis view of the same car, uh, where every sensor has its own coordinate frame based on where it is placed on the car. And you know it's, it's not just emulating the dynamics of the car, it's also emulating and simulating the data of the sensors in this world, which you can make to look like uh, the real world. And then, you know, we, we also have uh, uh, visualizers which can run in the browser itself. So WebWiz, uh, uh, I think, was developed uh, from one of the uh, autonomous uh, driving companies as an open source uh, visualization project. So this is like a lightweight version of Arvis, right? So if you see on the bottom left, uh, you can see it can play or replay a lot of the LiDAR data and the camera data uh, in, a, in a manner which doesn't uh, burden the, the computer. There's another tool called RQT Graph. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the QT visualization library, but RQT is the robotics, uh, you know, equivalent or ROS equivalent of that QT library. And so, so uh, remember how I showed you this cartoon image of uh, ROS uh, having these modular and parallel nodes interconnected with data. Uh, so this is the actual graph. Right? This is the computation uh, uh, execution graph uh, from the F110 simulator or the F110 car. And you can see how some of these executable or nodes, they are related to perception. Some will be related to planning and others are dedicated to control, right? So, so here is literally, uh, you know, the, uh, the actual uh, implementation of that modular parallel execution cycle that we spoke of. And this is on the on the one tenth scale, uh, but the same thing happens on on the full scale, right? So you have these different modules, and if you go deep into one of them, let's say uh, localization from AutoWare, you will see you have these uh, you know different nodes. Um, it's not relevant right now to understand each one of them uh, uh, and what they do. Um, we'll get into the weeds of uh, you know what localization is uh, as its own de uh, dedicated week, uh, but um, I want to show you you know RQT and this control flow diagram uh, works on the full scale as it works on the one ten scale. So that's why uh, F one ten is a very good entry point to get to learn about these perception planning, control, localization, mapping uh, uh, principles that are applicable to any autonomous vehicle, whether it's racing or not. Okay, so in the in the remainder of today's uh, today's video, I'm going to just introduce some core um, ROS concepts, uh, and then we will also look at some specific commands that we will practice in the lab session this week, uh, which will be posted later. 
so the the if it's not yet clear or emphasized enough, the execution in ROS is done in terms of these nodes. So a ROS node can be thought of as as an uh, as an isolated or a very specific uh, executable process, which is specific in terms of its functionality or the kind of data it is uh, processing, um, or you know what part of the stack. Uh, is that node trying to be part of, right? So maybe this example will uh, will help clarify. Uh, so you you want to process some camera images. So you have a node which maybe is getting data from the camera, right? So it's its own process. Then it's exchanging some information with the image processing node, which will ingest these raw images or RGB images. Then this processing will maybe give you an idea of where to move next. And this planning or, or motion uh, controller or motion planning will tell you, you know, uh, will give some commands to the actual planning algorithm to avoid obstacles and what have you. And then uh, ultimately it will send some commands to, uh, uh, to control the motor or the steering servo and, and execute that plan, right? So, so each of these tasks can be thought of as its own ROS node. So ROS node is literally code that you will write to define each of these tasks. And then the question is, well, how do these tasks interact? They interact with each other through topics and messages. So they exchange messages with each other on specific channels called topics. And so I said when I introduced ROS that you don't have to worry about establishing these connections, right? So what is the use of using ROS if you had to also ensure that data is getting sent and received uh, at the same time, right? So that would be uh, quite mind boggling. So underneath the hood, in the background, there is a most critical node or the most important um, you know, node which runs, it's called the ROS master. It's the first thing which will always run because the ROS master is the one which is allowing other nodes to exchange data and to register these topics and messages. Okay, so ROS master in a nutshell is the heartbeat of ROS1 style of coding. And so uh, you, the very first thing you do when you launch ROS, when you install ROS Melodic on your Ubuntu 18.04 um, VM or, or, or um, host machine, uh, you open up a terminal shell and the first thing you will always do is uh, you will start a ROS master instance by writing this exact command called ROS core. And when you write this command, it will tell you if everything is working fine that the ROS master has started running. So ROS master is the backbone that makes ROS tick or ROS work. And every node, when it is launched, will register itself with the ROS master. So if we go back to the concepts of nodes, nodes themselves are these executable programs as is shown here. So you have node one, you have node two, uh, Node 1 will be, let's say, in its own Python executable called node1.py. Node 2 would be in its own Python executable called node2.py. And in that executable, when you initialize a piece of code as a ROS node, it automatically is registering itself with the ROS master when you launch, when you launch that node. Okay, so, so, so that's the role of the ROS master and nodes. And so now let's talk about how do nodes exchange information. So the most easiest way for nodes to exchange information is through something called topics. And think of topics as dedicated virtual channels. They are literally some TCP sockets which are created ad hoc by the ROS master. So they are channels over which nodes will exchange data or messages, right? So, so uh, I like this example a lot because it helps uh, clarify a lot of these different issues. So let's see what is going on uh, in this illustration. You have, uh, the actual hardware, which let's say is hooked up to the onboard computer. And there is a node called the Hakuyo node. Hakuyo is the brand of the LiDAR. The Hakuyo node is uh, getting new data of how the LiDAR sees the different distances to the world. And there's another node which you have written in your assignment called the mapping node. 
it wants to build a map from this LIDAR scan. Actually, we covered the very quick principle of how this is done in the in the inaugural lecture, right? So, so we have a node called Hakuyo node and we have a mapping node. So the mapping node needs this scan information from the Hakuyo node or the, or the LIDAR in this case. So in ROS, that happens by declaring a topic, right? So we have a topic called scan and the topic is such that a node can publish data on a topic and another node can subscribe to a topic. So in this configuration, our Hukuyo node is a publisher node. It's publishing uh, information on this topic called scan. We'll take a deeper look at what that information is. Scan is just the name of the channel. It's not the actual message itself. The message can have many, many different things in it. So. Node 1, which is the Hakuyo node, is a publisher and it publishes on a topic called scan. And then the mapping node or some other node who wants this information, that can subscribe to the topic called scan. And then it will automatically, for every new message received on this topic, it will get some callback or an event triggered interruption in its execution. Right, so, so topics follow this publisher subscriber model of information exchange very very powerful very very scalable you will see a lot of examples uh, in this course and so so i hope this this is clear so a publisher is streaming its data or messages on a dedicated topic you can name that topic anything you want for this example i'm calling it scan and then many many subscribers this picture just shows one subscriber but any subscriber who is interested in receiving these messages on this topic can just subscribe to the topic itself. So that's how nodes exchange messages through topics. Uh, this is not the only way to exchange messages. There's something called services as well, but uh, we'll leave that for a later date. So I hope this was clear. And so if we go back to our uh, kind of you know diagram, which is trying to capture everything, uh, you have a node which could be the publisher. Then you have another node which is the subscriber, and they want to exchange some messages, what they will do is the publisher will say, I want to publish on some topic, right? So in our previous example, that topic was scan, because this was the LiDAR node. And so the LiDAR starts publishing on a topic called scan, and node two will say, I want to subscribe to the topic called scan, and then it will start receiving messages published by the LiDAR. And by the way, how is this happening? There's no points for guessing. It's all being facilitated by the ROS master, right? So when you when you say you want to publish something, the ROS master will keep a list of the topics being published. When you say you want to subscribe to something, the ROS master is going to match up with that list and then say, oh yeah, I found the topic you are interested in subscribing to, so I'll create this uh, you know, topic channel between you two nodes, like the peer-to-peer -peer channel. If it doesn't find it, it'll complain. It'll say, I didn't find the topic you are trying to subscribe to. So it's very important to understand topics and nodes. And then the next thing is, on that topic, what is actually being sent? What is the data which you can publish on the topic? And that is called ROS messages, right? So messages, not just a generic description. There is something called ROS messages in the world of ROS. And they are nothing but they are data structures, right? So they are data structures which define what data, oops, that was a very bad straight line, but that they are data, they are data structures which define what data am I allowed to publish for a given topic. Okay, so if we go back to our example, the Hakuyo node, which is our publisher, is publishing on the topic. The name of the topic is scan. And the mapping node is subscribing to this topic. But if you were to take the lens and inspect all the messages flowing through this topic, that's what this data structure is, right? So the message itself has a different name in this case. It's called the laser scan. Think of it as a packet, but we don't really call it packets because they aren't really packets, they are data structures. And so, so uh, here is an example of what the laser scan message looks like. So every message published on the topic has to be in this format, which is the message type. And so here quickly, I'll give you a sense of what you are seeing. Uh, on the bottom left, you see uh, just an illustration of 
uh, you know, if you were looking at the LiDAR uh, from like a top-down view, it is scanning in some field of view, right? So it's roughly 270 degrees uh, field of view. And so it's a, for every scan, it generates a message and the message will tell you what is the min and the max um, uh, kind of a radial of the scan. Uh, it will tell you uh, the increments of the scan. So, you know, what is this kind of discretization? It'll tell you the, the maximum and minimum range reported. And then it'll give you an array of some, you know, thousand values corresponding to each of the, of the LiDAR scans, which is the point cloud. Right, so this is uh, too much information for, for this particular slide, but I just want to make sure that you understand the entire example, right? So what you need to take away is that the message is the data structure. The publisher sends messages one after the other at some predefined rate on a dedicated topic at which it is published. And the subscriber who is subscribing to that topic will get interrupted or get a callback for every new message that is received. And these messages are timestamped automatically. All these connections are automatically established uh, by the ROS master. So you don't have to worry about it. All you need to worry about is functionality, right? So let's not lose uh, sight of the high level concept here. You only focus on what data you want to send to whom in terms of nodes, and ROS will handle everything else, which is the plumbing and the process management and the time synchronization and what have you. Right, so 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 if we revisit our previous picture, we are you know node one is publishing and node two is subscribing uh, on some topic, but the contents of what this topic is facilitating is this message type, right? So this is a data structure. So in that data structure, you use your regular typecasting arguments and specify what is allowed to be sent. Uh, if you deviate from this, then message is invalid, and so this definition of what you are allowed to send is stored inside a specific format in ROS called .msg or a message file. Okay, and we'll have again a dedicated uh, lecture on messages and services. So, in a nutshell, that's mostly what you know the basic principles of ROS is, right? So it's, it's facilitating communication between nodes. You have a publisher and a subscriber model where the publisher publishes data on channels which are called topics. In our ongoing example, the name of the topic is scan. In this topic, the publisher sends messages of type laser scan. So laser scan is the data structure that I showed you before. And then the other thing is that this communication can be one to many. The publisher actually doesn't care how many subscribers subscribe to that topic. The job of the publisher is to just publish. And whatever node, node two and you know node three, as many nodes as we want, they can all subscribe to the topic scan. They can all subscribe to the topic scan. And every one of them will receive a copy of each message. And in their own execution flow, if you are a subscriber, you will be interrupted when you get a new packet or a new uh, message on a on a subscribed topic, and then you can process that in the in the callback function in the node. Okay, so publisher communicates with the subscriber through topics, and the data exchange on topics are called messages. All right, so. How do we organize all of the already? We have you know definitions of nodes, we have messages, so it can get a little bit messy. So uh, another uh, kind of uh, uh, um, way to organize all the code in ROS is through packaging them into something literally called a ROS package, right? So a package is nothing but a collection of uh, nodes and messages, or one or more nodes. So if you have you know, uh, a mapping package, it may have a node which reads the map. It may have a node which reads the laser data. It may have a node which computes some transformation. But all of them together can be part of the packing, uh, the mapping package. And so um, it's not entirely the case that packages are just a collection of nodes. They can also include things like custom message types and, and services. We haven't defined services yet, so I didn't want to emphasize that. But package is more of a construct to organize the code, okay? 
So, so let's revisit this computation graph uh, idea that is the, you know, the basis or the canonical uh, to execution of ROS. Um, so as is shown here, you have ROS master running in the background. We don't always show all the links to each and every node. So you know, remember, in reality, the ROS master is keeping tabs on every single node that is executing, but we just don't show it for the uh, sake of brevity. But we have ROS master running in the background, and then we have the different nodes. We have the LiDAR node, we have mapping node, localization, planning, control. And they are exchanging data on topics. Um, and the, another powerful aspect of ROS, as is also shown uh, in this picture, is these nodes don't all have to be in the same programming language, right? So as long as you're using a programming language which is in supported by the ROS API, uh, you can use whatever distribution you want, right? Based on the functionality again. So again, the emphasis, like I said, is on uh, functionality and not getting caught up in these details of uh, uh, establishing the, the virtual connections. And not only that, they can be on different devices, right? So you can actually uh, have the, the localization run on hardware one, and then something else, another, you know, Raspberry Pi, which is running the control command, which I assume is what is meant by robot. Okay, so, so, so this is just an example of the computation flow and emphasizing uh, this multilingual aspect of ROS execution. So once again, let's take another look at the main thing. I keep repeating it because I really want you to get comfortable with this idea that you have publisher, which publishes or advertises. Um, I'll tell you why, uh, you know, there's also reason why you use one term versus the other, uh, but it publishes or advertises on a topic. And this topic is also registered with the ROS master. That's what this is for. This dash, uh, dash connection just shows that when a publisher starts publishing, the ROS master is made aware of the name of this topic. And then the kind of data you are allowed to publish is uh, um, defined in this message file, .msg. And then the subscriber says, I want to listen to this topic. And so uh, it establishes a connection with ROS master. And then listening um, to the topic will automatically give the subscriber access to the messages. The important point I want to make here is that these messages are asynchronous, right? So this, uh, let me uh, correct the statement. The publisher subscriber model is asynchronous, meaning there is no acknowledgement of any kind that the publisher will get back based on uh, you know who is subscribing, and so so publishers actually don't even know if anyone is listening or not. They are just publishers, so they will broadcast their data at whatever rate you specify in the execution code. And some messages may also get dropped. It's uh, very common for that to happen as well. Uh, this is again one of the, uh, the reasons why ROS2 exists actually, to uh, give more quality assurances on these uh, exchange of data. And then subscribers are event driven, event triggered, meaning that when you get a new message, uh, you have to process it internally for every new message you get. So this you know, lends itself very naturally to these kind of usings of, uh, of, of reading data from sensors. So each of the, the node corresponding to every sensor, um, you can think of it as a publisher. And uh, you know, even your localization node or your reading your own position is something that you want to subscribe to as some kind of a localization node. Uh, so many of the tasks that we have been uh, thinking about for self-driving already lend themselves uh, very well to this publisher subscriber model. So another thing that you often get confused, which is why I'm trying to repeat it again, is the difference between what is a topic and what are messages, right? So messages, remember, are the data types. And topic is the actual channel, and they both have different names, right? So in this case, image is the name of the topic, and Camera one is publishing a message of type camera one RGB and camera two, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I said it the other way around. So see, even I can get confused. So camera one RGB is the name of the topic. Because there are two cameras, we have two different topics, right? So we have topic one and we have topic two. However, both of these topics are at the end of the day, just sending images. So the data type is just image, so the image this is the dot message type, where we can define what an image is. 
And the idea is that different topics, topic one and topic two, they can use the same message type. So message types can be used as many, um, uh, as many, as often as you want for as many topics as you want, but each topic must have a unique name. And what, what is shown here is also that you have two publishers. Both of them are publishing on their own topic. And then you have a subscriber, which is subscribing to more than one topic, right? So this subscriber is subscribing to both topic one and topic two. And for every image which is received on topic one or topic two, it will be interrupted and it'll have to handle that data. So, so very important to clarify what are topics and what are our messages. Um, and as I've said before, just re-emphasizing that again, uh, you can have one too many sort of a relation. So you have a single publisher and then you have many, many different subscribers, each of them getting every image that the publisher publishes or advertises. So if this is still not enough, uh, I'll stretch it and show you one more uh, example and then then you know that will all that's all we'll talk about the publisher subscriber model at least at the introductory level so once again remember nodes are um, executables with specific functions and something which is very important is having the ROS master which is always running when you uh, when you type in ROS core and so let's say the camera uh, you know wants to publish or advertise images it will uh, make that intent uh, uh, available to the ROS master through its own code. And then the ROS master will have a list of topics that it will maintain. And then once some subscriber is trying to subscribe to that same topic, it will see if that topic name that the subscriber wants to subscribe to is present in this list of topics or active topics. In this case, because there is a direct match, the ROS master will facilitate a direct channel which is the actual topic itself. And this is a virtual TCP socket. We'll, we'll get to this when we look at the, um, the lab session corresponding to a publishing and subscribing. And so a dedicated channel is open between the publisher and the subscriber, and then you start publishing messages. In this case, you publish messages of the type IMG or image uh, on this topic called images, which the viewer uh, will receive. And then if there's another viewer who also wants to subscribe to images, then a ROS master will open another channel with the same topic name, but a new TCP socket because they are two different nodes. Okay, so I hope all of this clarifies what is ROS master, what is a node, what is a topic, and what is a message, and what is this publishing subscribing model, because that's really uh, very, very important to understand and get comfortable with uh, as we work with ROS. And uh, once again, this is just the to build your intuition in the lab session when you actually uh, follow along with me and I will show you how all of this works in code, uh, then you will have a better handle of, uh, uh, of these concepts and it will clarify any, any confusion you may have right now. So to close off, let me quickly walk you through some very important commands. We will revisit them in the, in the lab session. Uh, we've already seen all of them. I just didn't emphasize it because there was this dedicated portion of the, of the concluding of the lecture uh, on it. So ROS score is the very first thing that you do uh, when you start ROS. And what it does is it, it uh, boots up the ROS master uh, without which nothing will work. Uh, and then it also starts a bunch of uh, logging nodes uh, that will be useful for debugging. And we will see examples of that in the lab session. Then uh, I, I've been emphasizing that you organize stuff in, row, in nodes and the nodes are running. Well, how do you actually execute a node? Um, the command to do that is called ROS run, and you will use this a lot. Uh, and the format of this command is uh, ROS run followed by the name of the package to which the node belongs followed by the name of the node itself. And so here's an example. Uh, to launch the Hukuyo node, we have to say ROS run name of the package in this case is the same as the name of the node that not that will that will not always be the case but i've shown you this so that you don't get confused when you see why is the package name the same as the node name that's allowed right so so because a package is a collection of one or more nodes so technically even if you have just one node it should be fine anyways uh, in this case we would say ros run package name is hokuyo node 
and the node name is Hakuyo node as well. And this will start executing Hakuyo node. So in, if, if our Hakuyo node is the one which publishes uh, on the topic scan, we would start looking, uh, we, uh, if we inspect ROS, we will start seeing the topic scan being made available because the, the node has executed. So, so remember that the format that's important, ROS run package name node name. There's many more things you can do besides uh, just running the node. If you want to interact with the ROS node, uh, here are the top commands that we will often use. Uh, we can say ROS node list without any argument, and it will just show us the list of all the nodes running uh, in the system. Uh, we can then inspect a particular node by either saying, give me more info by saying ROS node info. Uh, we can stop the execution of any particular node, or we can check if we have a connection to any particular mode. And again, I'm uh, pacing a little bit faster through this because this is the basis for all of the, the lab sessions that we'll do this week. Uh, you also don't have to remember all these commands, by the way, but you know, since you work with them a lot, you will remember most of them because I will show you uh, how to discover these commands as well if you, if you don't want to remember them. So lastly, we also want to interact with topics. They seem like an important thing to, to get a handle on. So just like nodes, uh, you can ask ROS to list all the topics by saying ROS topic list, and it'll list all the active topics uh, to which there is at least one publisher or one subscriber. Uh, and then you can uh, inspect any particular topic in the same way you could uh, um, interact with nodes by saying ROS, node, uh, ROS topic info, um, and things like that. The more important and more useful command uh, is the one here, which says ROS topic echo and the name of the topic. And what this does is it will start printing the messages of the topic uh, on your terminal session where you run this command. So it will echo the messages which are being transmitted by the publisher on that topic uh, for you to just visually inspect or, or log and do something clever with it. So we will go over all of these uh, in, our, in our lab exercise. Yeah, so to, to conclude, I want to emphasize that um, here are many of the supported client libraries. Um, you know, you can work in C++, you can work in Python. A uh, lot of the F110 stuff tends to be in Python. A lot of the computer vision stuff tends to be in C++. Uh, I've, I've even had some students use Java in the past. It's a totally your, your call, but uh, we will stick with, uh, uh, with RossPy and, uh, uh, um, and you know, that's compatible with the uh, with Ross Melodic. And a lot of the subsequent lectures will go into uh, details of how do you um, program these nodes, uh, how do you declare something as a subscriber, as a publisher, how do you define a topic, how do you define message types, right? So, so this was the, the high level introduction to, um, you know, beginner level introduction to what is even Ross and what concepts are involved in ROS, but subsequently we will go into uh, each of these uh, having its own sort of a detailed view. Uh, and then once we all feel comfortable uh, working with ROS and understanding and writing our own nodes and our own code base, uh, then we'll quickly you know, transition into uh, the F110 simulator. So all of this time will be spent in sort of preparation for you to seamlessly work with the F110 autonomous racing simulator. Uh, just one thing I want to uh, uh, point out here because I had brought it up in one of the slides. Um, so if you look at the C++ API and the Python API, uh, you can see that uh, a publisher in C++ is called uh, advertise, whereas in Python it is called uh, a publisher. So, so that's why uh, in some documents and in some tutorials, uh, if you see that you, are, you know they are saying you are advertising on a topic, it really means you are still publishing uh, on a topic. But nothing to worry about. These are things we will all cover uh, in this course. Um, so, so this is really the last thing I, I want to talk about because I, um, uh, this was one of the things on the agenda of this video. And it's more of a commentary rather than a deep dive into ROS1 versus ROS2, right? So as I said before, uh, Noetic is the last release uh, of ROS1, um, and we will be learning ROS1. Uh, I still think that to appreciate and really get going with ROS2, it's, it's fine to learn ROS1. It's not uh, necessary. You can directly start doing ROS2 tutorials. But many of the concepts of uh, of the nodes and the peer-to-peer -peer, 
Um, they are easier to manage uh, if you learn them in ROS 1 first, and then you will even appreciate more why ROS 2 uh, is better or in what ways does it, is it different from ROS 1. And you know, it's, there is no rush. Uh, uh, this will be supported till 2023 or 25, so at least we are good for, for this year, uh, if not more. Uh, but so you should know that ROS 1, there's no new versions planned. It, uh, Noetic is the last one, and we are not even using Noetic, we are using Melodic, which is uh, uh, the one before. Noetic also supports Python 3. Melodic still uh, is in the, the two, um, Python 2.7 world. Uh, I know that that has also stopped uh, in terms of, you know, there's no support for that anymore, but everything in Melodic will still work. So you don't have to worry about that. And since you are using a VM or, uh, uh, or you know some kind of a dual boot uh, environment, uh, you can have your you know deep learning Python three stuff running independently, and it should coexist with the uh, with ROS. So it shouldn't break down. And uh, you know if something goes wrong, uh, always feel free to post that on Piazza, and someone will try to to help you out. Um, for ROS two, the current version is Foxy, which was released uh, last year. So. Um, you know, ROS2 development has really, really ramped up. Um, in a nutshell, uh, this is the difference. The difference is not just you know at the application layer on how nodes are organized and things like that. Uh, it's it's very very core and fundamental, right? So what I what I showed you today was sort of a this this hierarchy of uh, of the robot, right? So I said everything is handled by the ROS master, and then uh, based on you know you can use different client libraries. And ROS facilitates these virtual TCP sockets to facilitate the exchange of messages over topics. Uh, in ROS 2, there, there is more, you know, a semblance of an actual kernel, if you will. Uh, so there is a common library which is uh, written in C, and then the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer communication is is updated with what is called DDS, and we'll we'll get into DDS when we talk more about. ROS2, but think of it as it's P2P communication, but with quality assurances, right? So like I said, um, in one of the slides, there's no guarantees that whatever the publisher is uh, echoing or publishing is being received by the subscriber, but uh, in ROS2, you can specify that quality of service or guarantees with, the, with DDS. Uh, in fact, from the application standpoint, it's pretty much the same, which is why I said that you can learn a lot about the functionality and the usage uh, by just learning ROS1. And then uh, you know, you'll appreciate this jump from uh, the ROS master world into the DDS world even more. So, so that's why it's a very intentional, conscious choice to sh teach you the concepts, which are the, uh, the blue part, if you will, of both these figures first, and then worry about um, uh, you know, what is the, the difference in implementation and porting from one to two. And uh, I won't bother uh, uh, reading all of this, but I have included this uh, this comparison, uh, which uh, goes a little bit uh, more step-by-step uh, -step breakdown of how the two compare uh, to each other. So, so you can pause the video and uh, um, and learn about this as well. All right. So, so with that, this brings us to the conclusion of our very first uh, introduction to robot operating system. Um, I hope you now understand why we need ROS, what is ROS, how does it work, uh, and you know how it makes our life much easier as a, a robotics developer. Um, but you may still be wondering that I, I promised you and I promised to reveal you know, what's up with the turtles that, that ROS is uh, obsessed about. And uh, unfortunately, you have to wait a little bit longer if, because we will, uh, in the lab session, introduce what is called Turtle Sim, which is the inbuilt uh, simulator when you download um, ROS. And that's kind of your first hint, uh, Turtle Sim and Turtles. Um, but we will use Turtle Sim to learn and revisit all these concepts um, of ROS core, of ROS nodes, and ROS topics. And that will also uh, be uh, our first lab exercise for this semester. So if you haven't installed uh, Ubuntu yet, please do so. If you have Ubuntu, go ahead and install ROS Melodic. I will share the instructions for that over Piazza, uh, and it will be also posted on the course webpage. Um, and with that, this brings me to the end of the introduction to ROS. I'm excited to. Uh, do our first lab session together and that video will be posted uh, shortly. So I'll see you 
uh, during the lab session we will we will actually implement all of these things that we discussed today so take care i'll see you next time